Well, good afternoon and welcome to MedTech Crossroads. I'm Gene Paranak. Today is the 24th episode of this thing that started way back as COVID Connect, Friday, September 4th today. Today, I've got two wonderful guests. I've got Kelly Sexton from the University of Michigan Office of Technology Transfer. And after that, Ron Williams of MedBio, both uh, large figures in our local med device community here in Michigan and uh, technology in general. Uh, we don't have any news items today, so the first thing I want to do is welcome Kelly to the show and have her unmute her audio and video. Welcome, Kelly. Hey, Jean. Thanks for having me again. It's great to be back. It's good to see you. And yeah. I don't know if people uh, remember, but on the very first day that we did COVID Connect, uh, it was actually inspired in part by something that you did at OTT. Uh, where you guys reached out and started to aggregate a lot of the local folks who are working in response, which I thought was a beautiful uh, first step that you guys did. And we saw that and we said, oh, this, we could do this thing. And, and you came and um, I don't know if everyone remembers, but you were the very, very first guest for the first like minute on COVID Connect. So it's so nice to have you back under uh, more more normal circumstances. We're not there yet, but uh, but we're working on it. Yeah, so I think we've adjusted to the new normal. Yes, I think we're I think we're getting there. It's it's cool. Just for everybody's benefit, Kelly is the associate vice president for research, technology transfer, and innovation partnerships um, at U of M since 2018. And I guess the way I like to say it, Kelly, is is you really oversee this nexus of the University of Michigan does is it now 1.6 billion dollars of research every year, uh, at least that goes the 2019 number, and all of that when it comes out to the commercial world, that's really going through your office in the form of patents and agreements and everything else. Do I have my numbers roughly correct? Yeah, those are the most current numbers. The FY 21s haven't been released yet, but it'll it'll probably still be somewhere north of $1.5 billion in research activity across our campus. So. Which is incredible. And of course, a, a large portion of that does focus on medical and life sciences. And from that seat, I know it was really yeah. important to me now that, now that things are sort of slowing down, we're able to think about something resembling normal life again, mm -hmm. to have you come on and share your passion for what you see. Because you've, you've seen, I, th I think I read the stat was like, it's 500 uh, new invention disclosures last year something in those in those numbers, you see an incredible number of ideas and an incredible number of startups come out. And so you're getting this this constant flow that few people could ever see. What kind of passion does it generate for you in terms of what the community needs to understand or the community needs to know? Yeah, so yeah, I, I wanna thank you for that intro and also for you know creating this community and this place for people to come together and for having me back. So first I wanna say, I feel incredibly privileged and honored to um, every week get to see all of the new innovations that are coming out of you know, one of the world's largest research engines and um, the largest public research university in the country. And, and we do spend um, about three hours every Friday morning um, going over the latest and greatest. And so it gives me this wonderful opportunity to really you know, watch the cutting edge of innovation. And in a time like this, we get to actually see research turning on to help understand the pandemic, understand how to combat it, create new therapeutics, create new medical devices, um, new treatment opportunities, and, you know, a new public health understanding. Um, and just think of how much poorer our society would be without these tools that are generated at research universities um, to help us be able to understand and combat things like COVID. So for me, you know, people come into technology transfer from a variety of backgrounds. They come at it sometimes from law or from business or the startup world. For me, it was always about science. I came at it from science and I fell in love with research the first time I set foot in a research laboratory at my alma mater, the University of Georgia. And I remember thinking it was, it was, all, it was kind of like, almost like a sacred space because it was just this completely different world where people pursued, you know, absolute truth and would argue endlessly over experimental design and, and just trying to get to the facts and trying to, you know, mm -hmm. generate new knowledge. And so I've always just been following that throughout my career. And the thing that I hope um, to contribute to throughout my career is helping society understand the role of research universities 
Um, I know it was true when I was at um, UGA and it's, it's true at places like University of Michigan when the average citizen thinks about our university, they, the first thing that comes to mind is football <laughs> often. And then it's and then it's education and absolutely education and service are very important missions of the modern university, but mm. increasingly research is very important and it's um, something that we contribute to society that has really led to the economic prosperity that we enjoy as a country. And I'm worried that we haven't done a good enough job communicating this to the public, helping mm. them understand it. And so you see other countries learning from our success, investing in their research infrastructure, and we're not taking um, that large of a proactive approach. And I think it's incumbent upon people like myself and people at universities to do outreach and, and to help society understand that, you know, every new FDA approved drug over a six year period that was studied traced its roots back to basic science that was funded by the National Institutes of Health, most of it at universities. So if you want new therapeutics, new drugs, if you want to see new medical devices, if you want new industries created, we have to support this basic science research infrastructure. It's a really important point because I think we've seen in the, in the number of years that we've been involved in this community and you know the external work of translating ideas into products and companies we see that oftentimes there's this push and sometimes sometimes outside industry is pushing academia and saying well you had an idea i need that thing to be instantly converted into a into a product and of course we go that's that's not quite how it works there are a few steps in between it's like it's not idea money it's idea and then fail that idea and then get the next idea and move it along I don't think that people often understand how much of an infrastructure you need behind the scenes to be having people who are thinking about these problems generically who can have expertise in them and then when something comes along say okay you know a lot about this now go let's take that next step so that we can then take that and translate it can you give us any examples um let's use COVID as an example recently i think you mentioned to me that you did I get the number wrong? 400 research projects now with respect yeah. to COVID? It's over 230 at 230, least. I'm These sorry. are self, okay. self-reported self projects across our campus. So yeah, Gene, that's a, that's a great example. So, you know, kind of the moment people started hearing about, mm -hmm. you know, this new virus um, that's, you know, now spreading throughout through communities, you saw the scientific community pivot its resources to go after that. And so uh, just at the University of Michigan, we now have over 230 self-reported research projects that are working on COVID-19. We probably had about zero or one, <laughs> you, know, pri you know, earlier um, this year. So it's really just a huge magnitude of, you know, research power going after this problem. And this is just at one university. So, you, you know, imagine this happening at scale, it's happening at University of Michigan, and it's happening at universities across our country. And much of this activity happened before there was focused funding for COVID research. It's because mm. we have a robust and resilient infrastructure. And when there is a massive societal problem, some you know new threat confronting existential threat confronting our society you want scientists to have this capacity to be able to take their area of knowledge and go after this problem and we saw it happen across our campus and you know it it gives me hope and optimism for the future that's really cool i don't think many of us have thought about it that way the fact that the researchers who were there who had the facilities, had the knowledge, had the expertise, could instantly turn on that research without even knowing that the, the, the additional funding that we would normally wait for and say, okay, I need that so that I can do this research. They were able to start. This, this, this may be a number of a question we don't really have the numbers for, but would you, would you hazard a guess at how, fa how much having that in place accelerated what would have been otherwise a normal process of like, well, I got to go out for funding and then I've got to start this research. How much faster did we get there? Because we, we could go from zero to 60 
like that? I mean, I, I would say probably five or 10% of what has happened would have happened if, if we had followed a normal process and, and not just, you know, turned at it, you know, full throttle. Um, you know, so I, I think what I'm, you know, what I'm trying to articulate here is, is just the need for, you know, this resilient infrastructure. And I, I want to mention that a, a lot of the um, thought leadership in this area actually does come from University of Michigan. And I want to mention the work of my colleague, Jason Owen Smith. Um, so Jason is the director of IRIS, which is the Institute on uh, Research and Innovation and in Science. And as part of his academic study, he, he actually studies these systems of research connections across universities, across the country and across the world and helps articulate the value of that to society. So I think, I think we need more of that kind of activity. And I, I think we should all um, absolutely read his book. It's called um, Research and the Public Good um, the public to help. Good. Because I, I think the people on this call, um, you know, we're all benefiting from the funding that the federal government has put into the biosciences arena mm. over the last 50 years. And this audience should be advocates for, you know, continuing that private public partnership. That's huge. I love, I love just the anecdote of saying we were able to, to go when the need came up because that was already there. I think in chatting with you before, I mean, industry that comes to say office of technology transfer, they generally understand why they're coming. They generally understand I mean, at some level what they're, what they can get and what they're trying to pull from the university. I'm sure there's some some caveats on all sides of things. Academics generally understand the research they're trying to do, although I know from experience that it's often hard to make that translation between the academic and the commercial. But I think maybe what's coming out today is sort of, do we understand as the public that relationship, that interplay? It's hard enough to get the, the academic researcher and the commercial person to understand one another and to play that bridging role that you guys do so well. But there's this other layer, which is the government is is paying money to make this readiness, and the public has to understand that that's an important important thing. So you've got sort of four four different stakeholders going here the whole while. Yeah, yeah, and and the, I don't mean to dismiss how hard it is to sometimes could you know bridge the cultural divide between our academic community and industry, and I mean you know that's one that we we work at every day and you know, have some successes and, and have some fails along the way. But I, I just think it's it's important for it's important for universities, but I think it's just important for society that we understand um, you know, the role that publicly funded research plays in our everyday life. Like that's huge. I think we've got an opportunity now for people to have seen that with with COVID. And I, I love the anecdote of how quickly U of M and others were able to ramp up on these kinds of things. Now, you, we're going to talk about OTT specifically in a, in a minute, but I want to dive in for a second on, uh, first of all, who you work with, and then let's talk about the med tech space, because that's where our audience has a lot of interest in terms of what OTT sees. And it's worth everybody knowing, I mean, you guys work with everything from company formation of a new idea coming out of the university to a large company that comes and says, hey, you've got a technology that fits into our picket fence. We'd like to, we'd like to license it from you. But from what you've seen, and whether it's small startups or whether it's large companies coming to license, what are some of the challenges that you see specifically in the med tech and med device space? Right. Um, so, you know, I think part of the challenges are specific to med tech and med device, but not all. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's a common challenge that you'd find in at any university and in moving innovation out into the world, and it's the fact that the technologies we're seeing are at a very early stage because again, a lot of the, the federal funding is for basic science. Mm -hmm. And so there's typically a big gap between when your, your grant from the National Institute of Institutes of Health ends and where that technology needs to be in order for it to be ready to be, you know, launched as um, part of a startup company or licensed to an existing company. So, Bridging that gap is a challenge for any university, always always has been, and um, I think to some extent um, always will be. Um, but that's okay, because we can develop programs to help um, bridge that gap. And I think at, um, 
in our state, we have a program that I think should be the envy of every state around the country, and that is our MTRAC program. Um, so this is a partnership between the universities and uh, Michigan Economic Development Corporation. And MTRAC provides us with funding um, around different industry sectors to help bridge that gap for really promising um, programs. And it's, um, it's funding that's available not only to University of Michigan inventors, but to inventors at universities and research institutions around the state. So it's a, it's a statewide network and they have programs in um, life sciences, which would be relevant for this audience, but also in, in other sectors um, like advanced materials, transportation, um, ag bio, and, and so on. So first I wanna say we're really fortunate to have a, a, a state program that cares about this gap and cares about academic tech transfer and sees it as a viable component of economic development. So, so that's one piece and that's, that's common across all the sectors that we deal with. Um, another commonality is let's say we've been able to advance the technology and now we're ready to move forward with startup um, or licensing. You know, one of the challenges that any university outside of three areas of the country are going to face is that um, really, really robust entrepreneurial ecosystems tend to be clustered where the capital is. And, and specifically the venture capital. And venture capital is focused in three places, mm. California and even more specifically the Bay Area, Boston and New York. That's where 75% of the venture capital money is and the, mm. the investments are made. And so those areas just have these really vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystems that have grown up around them. So for any university that's um, you know not by you know, reasons of history and, and good fortune that happen to be founded in those areas. Our challenge is how do we figure out talent and um, specifically recruit the entrepreneurial and business talent for these new companies? And how do we find the financing for these companies? How do they get funded? And again, um, I'll say we're really fortunate on the talent side to have a great program that we're able to run out of Tech Transfer, and this is called the Tech Transfer Talent Network, T3N. Um, it's been running um, for, I believe, for well over a decade. And its purpose is really to bring experienced entrepreneurs, investors, and people with business expertise to universities to start working with our inventors from the moment where it's a faculty member and, a, and her graduate student with a great idea and to help mentor them and help develop the plan for connecting with that translational MTRAC funding. And then for developing a business plan, recruiting the entrepreneurial talent, and then launching the startup company and providing ongoing mentorship. In some cases, many years after that company is launched and left. And the third challenge is um, financing. And, you know, we've, we've talked about this before, Jean, and it's, it's just a fact um, that, you know, we could use with more early stage funding um, in our area. Uh, we know from data from PitchBook that in the Great Lakes region, it takes startup companies here on average about two and a half years longer to raise their first 500K in financing. We've made a lot of progress in this area and I think we're even continuing to make progress even in these challenging times. But I, I do think that's an area we want to address and we've got a few programs in our group that we're focused on such as creating a new source of funding called Accelerate Blue that we plan to use to invest in mm. startups. So specifically in med tech and med device, um, you know, we have the challenge that, um, you know, there's big regulatory hurdles and we want there to be good regulatory hurdles. You know, we, we want to have, um, you know, the, the gold standard of FDA approval process for our devices. So we know that when they get through, um, they're safe and um, as they should be when they're gonna be used on patients. Um, but when we're connecting with companies, they have to see a return on investment. They have to know that in order to um, put the money in to take the technologies through that regulatory process, that they're gonna be able to see the success on the other end and see a return on their investment. And so as a university, the best area where we can focus our effort is on de-risking those technologies as much as we can um, using these um, internal university resources and, and trying to give them their best opportunity to be licensed. 
Yeah, that's that's huge. I, I love what you guys are doing, and I think I see it at OTT, and I see it across the university, and I see it out in the ecosystem, like you mentioned, Mtrack, and we had Denise, and what she and Fred have done with uh, with Mtrack has been has been wonderful. Um, touch points. It's really about these touch points of getting people who have those early stage ideas, and then the people who may take them further, more opportunities to connect and to have heard the issues, to have heard the challenges, to know what hurdles are coming. I think in a in a earlier if you will, sort of generation of entrepreneurship, we would have this idea that you'd go through the process once and it would somehow just magically work. And now we know, no, it's it's a lot of shots on goal. It's a lot of tries. And just, I, I love, I applaud what you're doing to try even at that very early stage to start exposing people who maybe they're not quite ready for that next step yet, but you're exposing them to those ideas and you're exposing them to those people and you're just starting those conversations before they have to happen, which I think is just so important so that then when they do happen, this isn't the first time they've even had that idea, which is really, really cool that you guys are putting the resources there to do it. Yeah, and, and we're really fortunate that we have people like you and other members of the community that volunteer their time to sit on all of these boards, <laughs> like like the MTRAC Oversight Committee and, and to come to our events and to meet and talk with our um, inventors and with our faculty and to give presentations pro bono. I mean, we're part of a wonderful community and you know our organization and our, our research community benefits a lot from the people that are willing to you know roll up their sleeves and and take the time to advise these early stage projects and you've been working with us long enough gene you know that the at the early stages it's not always glamorous and it takes a lot of work to to polish the the story and the technology and move it forward so we're grateful to to people like you for sticking with us well, the raw enthusiasm of, of inventors is is infectious. I have a dear friend, uh, electrical engineer, Mark, who who one time looked at me and said, "Gene, once once this early stage stuff gets in your blood, it'll it'll never get out." And he was he was right. So we we love what we see. Yeah, Kelly, I wonder if you'd say before we open it up for questions, and I want to mention to our audience that we're we're happy to take your questions. You can raise your hand. You can uh, your your Zoom hand. You can put it in the Q and A if you've got a question. Uh, for Kelly, feel free to reach out here. I'm going to open it up for questions in just a second. But I wonder if you could take a minute. We've talked a little bit about, about the startups and some of the programs that are there. I guess it's a twofold question. One is for university innovators, um, did we go through the programs that you guys are offering? Are there any others that you'd like to mention just for completeness? And the other question is for outside entities, because we've it's not we, we've seen companies come, and they're not necessarily huge companies, but we've seen companies come to U of M and say, you've got a technology I'm interested in, and do a poll. And what can you say to folks, maybe they're smaller groups, maybe they're investor groups, but you guys have a nice system internally, and the big companies know what they're doing, but we do see from time to time these mid-sized companies come, and they want to do a tech poll from the university. Um, any guidance for them or any things that, uh, that they should know coming in the door? just that we we want to get we want you to come to us and and we we love market pull <laughs> it's so much easier when we're able to make a connection with something that a company is actually looking for and do matchmaking that way is so much easier than the way it, it typically happens when we have a great innovation and then we have to find where it fits and thank you for the reminder um you know so i, I just want to mention we've got you know a, a kind of a, a wealth of great translational programs at U of M within our med school. We have Fast Forward Medical Innovation. Um, they have a new um, $20 million translational program they're running, the Frankel um, Innovation um, Institute that's going to, you know, largely be complementary to programs like MTRAC and helping to de-risk and move big ideas forward. So. Um, we have a number of programs like that and within Tech Transfer, we, we work really hard to help our faculty um, connect with all of these for the benefit of their program. We're really excited about a new alliance we just announced um, a, a couple of months ago now with Deerfield Management Company, where they are actually setting aside a $130 million fund to focus exclusively on therapeutic projects from the University of Michigan to help advance them towards the clinic and to help launch and fund um, the resulting startup companies. So, you know, as we are an incredibly large university with a strong innovation pipeline and med device therapeutics and others. So it's it's wonderful to be able to have another toolkit 
um, another um, opportunity to help our faculty move their ideas forward. And so this relationship with Deerfield is one of them. That's amazing. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I think if there's one thing we want people to carry away from today, it's just to see what kind of a pipeline exists there. And it's cool to see it leveraged in a, in a time like COVID, all the re university resources. But I think people need to recognize that these things are happening for them behind the scenes. They may not see yeah. it every day, but they're happening and they're an important part of building this, this ecosystem. We've got a, a question from Jeff Reinvelt. Um, excited for Accelerate Blue Fund. Can you give us an update? Oh, Jeff. <laughs> yes, I can. I would love to. <laughs> oh, that was a that was a nice one. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the Accelerate Blue Fund is um, an early stage investment fund that we're raising through philanthropy for U of M startup companies um, based on uh, U of M IP that we're launching through the Office of Tech Transfer and the tech sector. So we are raising this fund through philanthropy so that it can be an evergreen and patient source of capital for U of M startup companies. We have set the goal. Long-term goal is $20 million. Near-term goal is $2 million as our first close. When we hit 2 million, we will stand the fund up and begin making investments. We are at $1.1 million um, for Accelerate Blue as of today. So Raising a first fund is always hard. Raising it in a pandemic is, has been a new wrinkle, but we've, we're continuing to make progress and have great conversations with U of M alums and supporters of the university around the country. Should also mention that um, Amazon is a supporter of Accelerate Blue and made a $200,000 $200, donation earlier this summer. Wow, very cool. Uh, great, yeah. great question, great answer. I love it. Well, let's see, not seeing any other questions. Kelly, is there anything else that we should know? We're so thankful for you having really gotten the community galvanized. We had, we had a number of people who just got out there, and I know you were one of the ones who helped us to get the word out for COVID Connect. We didn't get to hear much at the time, but it's so cool to hear today about this. I hope that you'll view this as a resource, and if there's ever anything that you can, uh, we can help get the word out about that you guys are trying to do, please do let us know. Any parting words for us or recommendations for the, uh, the startups, inventors, and or um, companies out there? Um, just to say you won't find a group of people who are really more passionate about what they do than the folks in the Office of Technology Transfer. Um, they're very much mission-driven people. So, you know, we'd love the opportunity to connect. And a big thank you, Gene, for creating this, this community and for having me back. It's so good to have you, Kelly. Thanks for being with us today. Yeah. Very exciting what they're doing, and of course, the very first time around, uh, we were all uh, we were all scrambling. So it's good to have Kelly back. Next up, I want to welcome Ron Williams. He is the chairman of MedBio to the show. Ron, you can unmute your audio and video, and we're glad to have you. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> It's, uh, it's great to see you. I apologize. I uh, had my thing all queued up here, and uh, I've uh, I got to grab it again. I apologize here. So we'll, everyone will uh, get on my case here while I bring this back up. There we go. I, Ron, it's good to have you today. I don't usually read long bios, but given what you have done in your career, I think it's important that our audience hears uh, who Ron Williams is and where he's been. Uh, so I'm just going to read this, this short bio for everybody. Ron began his career as a researcher at Battelle Columbus Labs. Later, we're not going to say what year that was. That was, uh, that was a while ago. Later moved to Baxter Labs, where he became VP and general manager of the Fenwald division, focused on blood collection, storage, and processing devices. In 1984, he joined DLP Inc. in Grand Rapids, Michigan as president and co-owner. And they did uh, disposable medical devices used primarily in cardiac surgery. In 1994, DLP was acquired by Medtronic, where Ron continued to serve as vice president. Then in 2006, Ron became an owner of MedBio, which is the company that he's still with, a small startup in Grand Rapids. But man, that small startup has grown, Ron. And uh, now you guys, um, you do medical device and biotechnology contract manufacturing. You've got two facilities there, Concept Molds. You recently partnered with a private equity firm, Graham Partners, and MedBio became the platform business for that. 
Now you guys have acquired AIM Plastics in Clinton Township, Michigan, and Polymer Conversions in Buffalo, New York, as of, I think, last week. So you have seen over your career everything from the early stage, I'm going to do a design, to product sales, to mergers and acquisitions, and now you're, you're riding high on this, uh, on this deal with, uh, with Graham, where you guys are, 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 are buying up uh, manufacturing floors and everything else. This is, this is absolutely phenomenal, and I thought it'd be really awesome if you could share with us some of the, some of the passion that you've had over the years with respect to how, how'd you get into this and how, what keeps you going on something like this? What matters to you? Wow, that's a very long description of a, an old man, I guess. <laughs> um, I feel like I've been in it since I was nine, actually. Um, got into it really sort of like a lot of people get into their careers, uh, starting out in engineering, not knowing really what I wanted to do, and kept moving from one sort of curriculum to another and ended up uh, getting a terminal degree. And at that time, electrical engineering with a biomedical option, there was no program like biomedical engineering back in those days. Um, so I was required to take a minor in physiology and do a thesis around some sort of medical uh, phenomenon of some sort. And I ended up doing uh, some computer modeling of the effects of nitrogen dioxide on rat lungs. <laughs> um, and then I went to Battelle, as you, as you mentioned, where I was in, uh, involved in many more practical research projects, I would say, where we're actually beginning to develop products themselves, which I found to be much more enjoyable than the basic research. Sorry, Kelly. <laughs> um, and I also found that I was probably a better manager than a researcher. So that sort of got me on the career of uh, sort of managing research. Um, from a passion standpoint, I guess I found that uh, I really love my work over the years. Um, probably had more fun working than vacationing. Uh, some people call me a workaholic. Maybe. I was going to say, we've got a word for that, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I find it rewarding to uh, design and manufacture products that help sick people. I mean, mm. It's uh, very rewarding. And not only that, you can get paid to do it. So it's a uh, double whammy. Um, creating jobs is a very rewarding part of the business. Um, and I think one of the things I really enjoy, have enjoyed over the years is creating what I call an environment for people to grow. Mm. Um, it's very, very rewarding to uh, hire a new college grad and watch him over five or 10 years progress and become uh, better and better at what he does and grow. And sometimes he leaves and goes to other organizations because you don't have the growth path that he really deserves. But that's rewarding even when they leave to see someone who's grown that much. To be able to develop people like that, you know, it's incredible to me because a lot of people, um, even today, and, and the state has certainly grown and there's, there's a lot happening, but a lot of people will find themselves temporarily in the med tech space. And you've literally been able to spend your whole career there. And I know there's a pressure, especially when we're talking about startups and inventors and people trying to get a new idea out there. And I know you work with a lot of them. We've we, into being in MedBio, have worked together on projects, and I'm glad to see you guys both working in the in the new development space as well as the really mature products and being able to to keep those going, which is really rare because a lot of times people will focus on one or the other. But I, I know that a startup when they are when they're coming and they're and they're and they're going forward, oftentimes culture is the last thing on their mind. So you're sitting there describing. Oh, I, I love seeing somebody come into the come into the business and then get to grow, and and move with their career and stuff. And I think a lot of people who are sort of new to the med tech industry, they're so focused on the next milestone that they've got to hit to keep the company in survival that they that they might, you might we might forgive them for sort of thinking, oh well, maybe you've got the luxury to think about that. Maybe you've, you know. Uh, this is a late. This is a late career thing where you can you can say things like that, Ron. I just don't believe it. I I've, I've got this thing that I'm up against. What would you say to somebody in that in that situation? Um, 
I, I guess I don't think it's ex necessarily uh, true for just med tech or biotechnology. It's true really for all businesses. Mm. I think if you create the right environment for people and you have treat them with respect, give them decent benefits, decent pay, make them feel part of the team. Uh, at the end of the day, they'll, they'll just jump over hoops and run through brick walls to do a good job for you. Mm. So I, I do think that sometimes we're worrying more about maybe the esoteric things than we do the, the fundamentals of, of a company, which is really a group of people doing a task. So uh, I think it's really important whether you're a startup or you're a large company. I would say it's harder to maintain it as you grow and you get mm. larger. You don't, I mean, there were times when we first started, I would know everyone who worked for us, their wife and the name of their dog. Uh, you, you know, now uh, sometimes I see people I really don't, haven't met and that's uh, it's not a good feeling, but that's the hardest part to maintain that culture as you grow, I would say. You described something to me called a management by walking around. Can you describe that for us? Uh, it's my favorite thing to do, particularly now since uh, I can uh, pretty much do what I want and not have any particular uh, critical path items. So, yeah, I think, and I think that's what we've lost with the COVID uh, interacting like mm. we are right now. Um, as I told you the other day, I think uh, it's pretty easy to have a meeting with people you, you know. Um, but when you're trying to introduce yourself or talk through a project with someone who's interested in doing business with you, you've never met them in person, it's much more difficult. But the management by walking around is things like you learn by just walking out of the restroom and running into someone and learning that there's a problem that you weren't even aware of. Uh, Sometimes it, it, the person that sees the problem really doesn't recognize maybe the deep impact that it might have on you. So it's really, uh, again, I think it's part of the culture where you, you, you listen to all people in the organization and you're surprised many times at uh, what you learn. It's not something you're gonna hear in a meeting. <laughs> That was a great reminder for me. I felt like when we were when we were chatting in preparation for this, that we weren't so much getting ready for a uh, a medtech crossroads interview, but I was getting this this deep business counsel. You described um, a, a few things that your that your that your company does and that you've discovered over the years. One of them was systems thinking, process thinking. The other was customers, a focus on customers, which I'm, I'm thankful to see even in early work these days, a lot of people are talking about like I-Core customer discovery and, and at least trying to get out there and ask questions. But of course, you've seen customer from mature market perspectives as well as early stage perspectives. And then you just described to us this culture question of, of caring about the employees. But unpack the customer end of things and unpack the uh, systems and process end of things and the importance of that? Well, I think uh, I, I can't overemphasize the importance of uh, systems, whether it's quality systems or even financial systems. I mean, you need to at all times, at certainly monthly review kind of where you are financially, um, look at your plan, see how you're measuring against it. I, I, and you need to have goals and key performance indicators that you, that you monitor and measure. Um, I think that's something that you can overlook when you get so things get so hectic that you're focused on the job and all at once you uh, realize that you're really off track as an organization. Mm -hmm. um, planning is, I always say plan your work and work your plan. Um, that usually works, but when someone throws COVID at you, that might, might upset the plan a little bit. Um, and that plan, I, I guess, needs to be sort of broken into phases. I mean, obviously, you kind of know what you're going to do each day. Um, I think yearly planning is important. So you know where you'd like to end up that year. And you can see, generally speaking, pretty clearly out to a year for your organization as to where you want to go, what you have to do to get there. So I have a one and then a three-year view of here's what I'd like to see by three years, and that's a little more cloudy. And then at five years, I, that's as far out as I can imagine, I guess. Um, so I think it's important to do that planning process and to measure against that plan and be willing to change it when things arrive as COVID or as a change in a marketplace or a, a disruptive technology enters your, enters your space.
Mm, yeah, the willingness to, to modify. But the, but the, some, some folks have said the plan is nothing but planning is everything in the sense that pre-thinking it and, and knowing which direction you're heading. And yeah, what, what I, you're I, think it, I think it can be overdone. Um, you know, I worked in some large organizations and uh, I never felt that spending months on a plan was really that beneficial. Um, you could probably do it in a two week time frame with your organization and be at least 95% as good as that three month program. So I like to do it a little more uh, briskly, I guess. No, that's, that's cool. You had an interesting anecdote about something that you've tried when it comes to uh, customers, but not even external customers. And that was something about viewing departments as businesses. Tell us more about that approach. You said this is something you've tried in the past, but it really it really focuses this idea of know your customer to a personal level for your employees. Describe that for our audience. Right. Um, well, in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a, a big push for continuous improvement, Kaizen, all I mean, You don't hear those terms quite as much now as you do. You hear lean a lot yet, but uh, at some point, people accused me, I guess even today, that I overdosed on that idea. Um, and in our previous company, we had probably 300 people, and I had uh, what we called mini companies, 30 of them, <laughs> roughly. And each one of those companies was to view themselves, uh, mini companies was to view themselves as a regular com co uh, company that had customers. Now, they might be internal customers if they're delivering a component to a, an assembly uh, department that was their customer was that assembly department if they were getting raw materials from another organization that was a, that was one of their vendors um, and then they had to do their activities and I found that it really gave people more of a sense of how a real business works because in a sense those those departments that might have had 10 to 15 people are little companies mm. so we did that for a long time uh, we we also to keep things lively did uh, problem solving. We had what we called storyboards, which really wasn't much different than the Deming cycle, I guess, which uh, plan, do, check, act. But we would uh, state the current situation you know, and we'd have easels where we'd actually make it visual. So we'd, people knew that we were working on this particular problem, whether it was reducing setup time or whatever, describe this current situation, what we're doing, what we found, and if we found that it worked, we'd put it into practice. And if it worked well, we would have a, have a celebration, or maybe as little as having donuts for everyone, but celebrate the success now and then. So that, that worked really well. Today, we uh, probably are not overdosing on it, but we still use it. Um, we have in our production floor, for example, four teams, as uh, we call them now, not many companies, but they could be called many companies. Uh, simple names like uh, silver, purple, green, and yellow, but uh, they, they work as a team. And I think uh, a small company is more efficient than a large one. And it's, in a sense, if you can break that down to a smaller organization, I think you'll find you're more, more efficient. So, I love that focus, though, of just of getting people, even, even if it's not formally forming a mini company, but just asking the team, okay, who are your customers and what do they need? That right there is sort of a revolutionary thought right. often. And they can measure their performance as a, as a part of the organization, not as, you know, what, what were our sales this month? Or were we profitable? How many units did we make? They can actually have their own key performance indicators that are relevant to their job. How about, now, how about if we take that up to the whole company level? So you, you, you've, you've taken that to, a, to, to this uh, maybe extreme, but nevertheless, it's a really compelling idea. Now, when you, when you sort of back that off and you go and you say, okay, now let's think about the whole company and its approach to its true customers, the ones who are actually paying it money and you're doing projects for, how do you think about outreach to those customers in terms of finding out what their needs are? So here we can advocate it at a local level, like team to team, but when it comes to the true customers of the company, what have you found are good ways to, to find out what your customer needs and what they want? Because you've obviously been successful in, in meeting that need, growing these firms in this way. So what's that secret? Well, I think I've said before, there are really only three things to make a successful business, and that's quality, cost, and delivery. Um, if you do those three things well, you probably don't need to worry too much about your customers because they're happy with you. 
and I guess at the end of the day, I'd say of all those three, um, quality is most important because if you have that, people pricing isn't quite so so uh, bad, so important. They'll be willing to pay a little premium for great quality. Um, interfacing with your customer. I mean, we have uh, people on our staff that, and particularly our engineering staff, works very closely with the engineers in their organization. Um, as you know, m most medical companies these days are required to do audits, and uh, so we do get feedback uh, at audits. Uh, sometimes we like it, sometimes we don't. Um, but that makes us better, I guess. Uh, we have, before COVID, we were probably averaging an audit a month by someone. Now, I'm not mm -hmm. talking about ISO auditing or FDA audits. This is actually customer audits. Um, so that was a, a good feedback thing. Now, with all the travel restrictions, it tends to be uh, check boxes on forms uh, more than it does really in-person audits. But uh, it's an important part of our business. It takes a lot of time, but it does make you better. You had mentioned uh, that in addition to quality, cost, and delivery, there were two more that you often tack on in your own mind. Well, yeah, I, I think safety and morale. I mean, I need to provide, again, back to that environment that I like to create, I guess. It needs to be a safe environment. And you need to really keep your finger on the pulse of morale in your organization. And, and uh, if people are unhappy, you need to be able to figure out what, what's causing that and see if there are ways you can correct it. Um, that means listening to people. Um, it means also you listen and sometimes you sit and you don't agree or you, you, you tell them uh, we're not going to change that or this. Um, but just the fact that you've listened to them and, and uh, heard them out really contributes to a morale where they, they feel free to tell you what they think about something, what we need, what we should change. Um, and there's a lot of good ideas come through the through the pipeline if you're willing to listen. The people that are doing the job really know the best solutions to many of the problems. Yeah, that's that's huge. I, lo I love those additions because it's uh, those really do help to build the kind of sustaining organizations that you've that you've done. I want to ask you another question, Ron, but I also want to go to our audience and say, if you've got any questions for Ron Williams, this guy has, has walked the walk over his career, all the way from product design to now building these manufacturing entities, doing med devices that are now uh, turning into, into really uh, powerhouses. Um, and so feel free to raise your hand if you've got a question, either about product development, manufacturing, or how, how do I run a business? Because that's where, that's where Ron has really uh, excelled over the years to grow these businesses. R Ron, what, is, what does it, and then after that, I want to ask you a question about MedBio and who should be contacting you and, and uh, whether it's, um, you know, when should they reach out and things like that. But before that, COVID, management by walking around. I love that idea. And now we're all sitting here across Zoom. We can't be all in the same place. And we hope that that'll be over soon, but it's not yet. What, what do you think that looks like? You've, you've got all these years of experience and now we're faced with this. What do you think that looks like? What is the same principle as management by walking around look like when we have to be across these, these screens? Well, <clears throat> um, there was a three month period there maybe when I think it was all, almost impossible. Truthfully, um, being an essential business, we were working 24 seven during the whole, whole time. Now, those who could work from home did, of course. And, uh, but at this point, I would say that with only a few people are still working from home and that's really more or less because that's what they always wanted to do. And they aren't really in a position where they're uh, required to be here every day. They can do pretty much their job from anywhere in the world, I guess. So we haven't really lost that walking around opportunity. Um, we do walk around in masks, so sometimes it's hard to recognize who you're, who you're, who you're getting input from. Um, but I do think that we will once again return to the sort of the old way where people come into work every day. It's really part of a social network when you come down to it as a work life. Um, it's an extended family in many ways, in my opinion. And I think we will get back to that when people are less afraid or the risk is defined as not being as high as it is now. Uh, I'm hopeful that anyway. 
Yeah, no, very good. Um, there was one note here, uh, I may make an introduction afterwards, although I believe uh, maybe m misunderstood here because uh, you guys are not, you're not in pharma, you're med device strictly. So there was a comment about a tablet press machine. We can follow up on that yeah. afterwards. Um, tell us, Ron, who should be coming to MedBio? And with, with all that you guys are doing now, and it's all across the spectrum, when should somebody reach out to MedBio? And, um, and what, what, what should they expect to find when they yeah. come there? I mean, we have really two separate businesses when you come down to it, which use common manufacturing techniques, I guess. One would be the medical device space, and the other is a biotechnology space. Um, but in any case, they should be coming as early as possible when they have their design sort of what they think frozen. Uh, before that even is a better time so that we can do uh, help with, uh, I call it, designed for manufacturability. I mean, there are lots and lots of things that I see that if we had a little bit more input, we could have made the product either uh, less costly for the tooling, uh, more, uh, more efficient to make, which would reduce cost. Um, we could probably have uh, reduced our tooling cost on a lot of, a lot of jobs that we see. Um, one of the things that I've seen over my career, I mean, I, I come from an era when I was in engineering school where I carried a, a board and a T-square. I don't know if people know that. I also had a, I also had a, uh, a slide rule, but um, in those days, I think there was, because of the system, you had to put more thought into the product itself. I could be wrong about that. Uh, I see people now coming in with designs that'll, uh, on a part, a simple part, and they might, they'll say, well, okay, I have 31 critical dimensions. And it drives me crazy. I mean, I, I say, really, I mean, if, uh, if, you're, if I'm molding a pen barrel, does a concentricity measurement call out to five thousandths or something really make a difference? So I think we've, 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 we do a much better job when we can measure things to a Nat's eyelash now. But I think uh, we've probably made it so easy to change the design and reflect things that uh, we sometimes overlook really the function that we're looking for. So earlier the better. Um, we work from napkins from time to time, um, maybe a little later than that, but uh, we do advanced development as well. So I think the hardest part for us is to help screen the product to see if it is going to be real. Um, obviously we'd like to get paid for our design input. <laughs> um, and sometimes we can save the customer a lot of money if they come in early. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge thing. I think it's interesting that you bring, uh, uh, if you, if you, um, uh, when you bring up the whole, we can make the product changes too quickly. I've often thought, because I, I learned engineering at about the point where we were switching over to CAD in, in mass, but we were still doing things with drawings and other things like that. And I think the fact that you can make those changes so quickly, that you can switch the CAD so quickly, doesn't mean the engineering thought has gone into it. Exactly. And that's that's really a, a critical thing. I want to, uh, if he's if he's still with us, I want to make David Derbyshire uh, live. You are with us. If you unmute there, David, are you with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome to the show. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Williams. It was a pleasure to have met you last year at the My Biz event uh, for Business of the Year. I forget the exact award that you received, but it's a pleasure talking to you that evening. Oh, thank uh, my you. question centers around uh, your business acquisition strategy. Um, in this uh, current economic climate, there's a lot of manufacturing that are, manufacturers that are stressed or potentially going under. Do you prefer to acquire companies that are about ready to fail with good manufacturing resources and are struggling, or would you prefer to acquire a company that has solid technologies that you could layer on your manufacturing resources to? Mm, good question. Um, yeah, I'm not a turnaround sort of sort of person. I like to see uh, companies that are actually pretty solid that have good a good management team. That's a very key factor, I think, if you're looking at acquiring an organization. Um, the technology, sometimes it's important to have sort of a unique capability, but more often I'm interested in those that really do a great job of executing. Um, and they need to be, in our case, complementary to what we do. That I mean, I would say our core competency largely would be centered around uh, 
injection molding, automation of processes, and assembly of medical devices and biotechnology parts. Um, so we like to see things that are complementary to that, but we could be interested in satellite technologies. We do a lot of over molding of steel, for example, whether it be a needle or a component for orthopedic surgery. Um, maybe we could get into the, the manufacturing of those components. Um, maybe we should get into a business that's doing uh, extrusion because there's an awful lot of tubing used in, uh, in medical devices. So either consistent with what we do, um, a complementary technology, but not some, something that is probably needing a turnaround kind of input or a big management change. We like to measure culture, as I mentioned before, as part of a due diligence, I guess. Tough to measure, but you can get a real sense of the quality of the organization by uh, working with each of the functional managers and uh, seeing seeing how they operate and what their what their uh, vision for the company is. Thank you Great. very much. I appreciate James, it. does that answer your question? Yes, it did very well. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, not seeing any more questions, Ron. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. It's just such a pleasure. I th I think you're. Um, it's 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 part just to say, look, MedBio is out there and they're doing great work. And if you're needing product uh, manufacturing out there, that's just a phenomenal resource. Um, we've worked with you guys before. And also, my goodness, you are like the management textbook right there. And it's been such a pleasure to, to hear some of these thoughts and techniques from you, management by walking around, et cetera. So we really appreciate you taking the time to come on today. Thanks very much for having me. I appreciate it a lot. A lot of fun. We'll do it again. Thank you. Thanks again. Well, it's great. It's so good to have everybody here. Kelly Sexton, thank you so much. Ron Williams, thank you so much. I'm going to take, as we always do, about 30 seconds to see if uh, anybody has a, uh, a comment that you'd like to make, a question that you'd like to ask. Maybe it's about something we've talked about on the show before. Um, and if you have anything or a announcement that you'd like to make about an organization that you're with, we'd be happy to have you come live for just a moment. Maybe there's an event coming up you want to tell people about. You are more than welcome. We want to keep this open and available. Uh, I'm going to give about another 20 seconds for that before we close out. Once again, uh, we don't often say it, but I want to thank uh, our team behind the scenes. Um, Today on the call, we've got uh, Aaron as well as Steve Minus, and uh, just can't tell you how much our team has been uh, making this happen. We do have a raised hand. Ken Spencer, you're live. Yeah, so Gene, um, one of the things in relative to events coming up, uh, you might want to check out Tech Transfer Celebrate Inven Invention uh, virtual seminar that's coming up here at the end of the month. Um, so, I mean, it's always a great event and stuff. That's great. If Kelly is still with us, and I think she is, maybe Kelly, do you want to come back on live and tell us for just a minute about that? Thank you so much. I was just pasting the Oops. link on the, on the right-hand side. Um, so the, the link for Celebrate Invention 2020 is available to all participants. And, and thank you so much for that plug. We've got a great lineup. I'll be interviewing President Schlissel about the role of the modern research universities. We have a great um, uh, event with Spark, um, Ann Arbor Spark around um, 2030, what the future holds and a lot of other great events. So please do join for that. Thank you so much. We appreciate that, Kelly. I appreciate that, Ken. Thank you so much. Well, not seeing any more uh, questions or comments or hands raised. I just want to thank you all for being part of this again today. Next week is our 25th episode, Hard to Believe. Thank you all for making it possible. And have a great Labor Day weekend. Talk to you soon.